All right. So it's clear, it's clear that technology matters. And it matters because it matters to us. And we've seen some great examples of that just here tonight, between medical technologies to better people's lives and cameras and imaging technologies to share important stories and cell phones to connect us. But technology doesn't really matter without us, even if it does matter with us. Like a cell phone sitting by itself doesn't necessarily have any moral worth, but an animal or a deer, we might say, does. Uh, a cell phone, we could say, is just matter. It's just mass in and of itself. It's not necessarily awake, while a deer actually is. It matters with an S. And although we would presume that human beings might have the, the grandest and richest sentience among the animals that we found on this planet, we can write poems and manage businesses and give funny TED Talks and things like that, uh, we also attribute moral worth to animals now as well. So even if a tropical fish or a deer or an ape can't do everything that we, that we can do, we still attribute moral worth to them. And I think it's good that we've gotten to that point. It seems very self-evident, right? But it wasn't that long ago in humanity when, when we presumed that any animal was weighed nothing on a moral scale and was, could be used like wheat or water or any other natural resource. Uh, that there was something magic about being human that made us morally worthy but nothing else was. I think it's good that we've graduated a bit beyond that. If there's technologies that negatively influence animals or other sentient life, we now take that to heart and aim to, to hedge against those risks. Um, we believe, or most of you probably do, if something has a brain, it can think and it can feel, then it weighs on a moral scale. I'm sort of glad that we've gotten there. And I, I think that most of the time when we talk about technology, we're talking about how it matters to us. I posit what would be the case when technology, if technology, could matter in and of itself. If our technologies could be aware and could in fact in and of themselves be awake. Um, and it seems very far out, but if we take a quick jaunt through the history of computing, uh, it might shed some light on where we might be. This is what computers looked like less than 70 years ago. This is the ENIAC at the University of Pennsylvania, my own alma mater. This device was 30 tons. Uh, it, it took up multiple rooms, and it was used to calculate uh, equations that humans couldn't necessarily figure out themselves, at least within one human lifetime. So very complicated algorithms around the, the trajectory of ballistics, for example. This is right after the Second World War. It was maybe 20 years after this that uh, IBM developed computers like the 7094 and the 360 series that helped Apollo 11 uh, get to the moon, let Neil Armstrong make that giant leap for mankind as the first man on the moon. Um, but we've made many giant leaps in computing technology since that time uh, that make many of IBM's dinosaur computers look sort of paltry in this day and age. Wouldn't surprise many of you that the cell phones that you carry in your pocket are astronomically more powerful than the ENIAC or anything used to put a man on the moon. This particular diagram is from a, a book by the uh, fellow by the name of Ray Kurzweil, which shows the price performance of computing over time. This is not only the accelerating trajectory of computing power, but also the, the accelerating drop in price of that relative computer power. This is calculations per second per thousands of dollars, um, which some people are supposing is bringing us relatively close to the point where an average laptop that you can buy for a thousand bucks will have as much raw computing power as a lower mammalian brain of some kind. It's a relatively big deal when you think about how complicated brains are. And Ray Kurzweil is not among the only folks who's of the belief that in the coming decade or so, we may have household computers, day-to-day -day computers, that contain the same raw computing power as a human brain. But it's not just raw computing power that would make a technology uh, morally relevant in and of itself. How many numbers can it crunch? That's not necessarily all that important in and of itself. We <coughs> want to know what can it do? Is it really smart? And we've had some decent displays of artificial intelligence over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, chess was long supposed to be a game that machine would just never catch up to man. Too cerebral, too strategic. But in fact, Deep Blue did beat Garry Kasparov, the then world champion, in 1997, and the game has been unwinnable by humans ever since. Um, it's interesting to make note that, that the Deep Blue computer that beat Garry was 1.4 tons of raw computing power. This was the finest supercomputer of its day just 15 years ago. Um, it's interesting to note that an iPhone 5 from 2012 has seven times the computing power that all of Deep Blue did. So to do the math for you, that's 15 years, that's seven times the computing power, and that's one eleven thousandth of the size. 
It's an interesting trend that's permitted for a lot of other interesting developments in artificial intelligence and computing in general. Uh, Jeopardy was, again, maybe long supposed to be the final stronghold of, of human wisdom, right? If there's anything unique about us, uh, whether it's cultural, memes, and interesting <laughs> things, <laughs> Jeopardy makes humanity unique. That's actually quite sad. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> if, uh, it, you know, cultural memes, scientific facts, and the congealing of both of those in the funny hodgepodge way that Jeopardy presents them, wouldn't that be the, the nut that could only be cracked by the human mind? Maybe that's what makes us special. Maybe that's where our, our magic is found. But, but as it turns out, as many of you know, Watson did in fact beat the two then Jeopardy! champions uh, handily. Look, massive landslide, and again, the game has been unwinnable by humans ever since. Um, Siri and there's other technologies sort of on their way up, right? Speech recognition. Siri's not a great intellectual partner at this point, right? You can't really discuss Proust or Ralph Waldo Emerson with Siri, but, but you, can, you can ask uh, for where the best place to get a pizza is, or find good directions, or pull up your recent photos by simply talking to your phone. If you look at that technology 10 years ago, very much not available in the ubiquitous sense that it is today. We have biomimetic technologies. This is a cheetah from an MIT lab. This uh, robotic animal can not only run at surprising speeds, but jump over objects, depending on how quickly it's moving. Very, very interesting to watch. You can look this up on Google. Uh, arguably, the, one of the wildest examples of biomimetic technology, this is the Atlas robot by Boston Dynamics. Um, this, this machine can walk on two legs. It's it's wild. If you look this up on YouTube, you can see them using this in the outdoors. This thing's climbing up hills and over tree stumps and, and balancing with its arms like people do. Absolutely insane. Sort of reminds me of an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. I, I, I forget which one it was, but it was one of, one of those Schwarzenegger movies. Um, regardless, so, so we have, we have uh, motor control. We have speech recognition. We have board games. Uh, there's, there's a lot of areas where humans aren't necessarily just being caught up to. They're, they're being beaten handily. And, and it, it brings to mind some of the, the fears posited by folks like Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking in just the last year around what the real consequences are of creating a super intelligence, something vastly beyond ourselves. If it was that much vastly beyond ourselves, as we are above maybe the lower animals, wouldn't it sort of trounce the planet as, as we have? And, and, and wouldn't that be morally consequential? But then again, Bill Gates isn't exactly an AI researcher. I mean, smart guy and all, but I think the, the worthwhile question to ask is, what do real folks doing real work in the AI field actually think about this? And luckily, some people have done legwork there. So Nick Bostrom at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford uh, asked 170 artificial intelligence researchers, not like guys that read sci-fi books, but people that create the machines that are in the Siri and all that, right? So, um, and, and he asked them, when, with a 50% confidence, coin toss odds, would you suppose we would have human-level machine intelligence? This isn't human level computing power. In fact, it's, it's reasonable to suppose that within the next two to four years, we may, in supercomputers, be able to house the entirety of the raw power of the human mind. But general intelligence, the flexible, amazing kind of intelligence that we have allows us to write poems, manage businesses, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and the median answer from 170 of these researchers was 2040, which, which means that half of them guessed a date before 2040, half of them after such as uh, the nature of media. So it appears as though some of these folks in the AI field don't necessarily believe that poetry writing and managing businesses are, are inherently magic, but that if we understand cognitive science, if we can advance artificial intelligence, we may in fact be able to get there. But what about consciousness? A really complicated machine that can do smart things but isn't actually aware, doesn't really matter very much. So I asked my own poll of of 33 different artificial intelligence researchers, folks with doctorates from places like Stanford and Oxford, um, when with 90% confidence, about as close to certainty in future projections as you can get, would you suppose that we'd be able to replicate sentience in machines? That is to say, the internal movie that we are all experiencing right now, the ability to suffer, the ability to be happy, the ability to really be awake, have a temporal real self that's experienced in the now, and the, the, the response that, was, that we got back most was, from 2036 to uh, 2060. Interestingly enough, other than the folks that decided not to hazard a guess because they don't want to be on record, which I totally understand, these are scientists, they, they get finicky about that kind of thing, um, <laughs> it is, uh, is um, the next most likely response was from 2021 to 2035. So we could suppose maybe, maybe, that in the next two decades, we might have some kind of a machine that replicates not only the intelligence, but maybe the sentience of, let's say, a dog. So this would be something that, that uh, you know, 
would, would be able to play around in the real world, would be able to understand its sensory experience, have, have a knowledge of the past, and have some kind of a rough understanding of the future, and that we wouldn't just treat like a machine anymore. It wouldn't just be empty mass. This would, in fact, have some moral worth to it. We'd have to care for the thing, or feed it, or something. Robots don't eat, probably. But, um, <laughs> but we'd, have to, we'd have to treat it a lot differently than we currently treat our vacuum cleaner. Uh, but, but it's reasonable to suppose that if we were able to replicate that much intelligence and that much sentience, into a machine that if, if any part of this trajectory continued, um, that it might not be horribly long until Bostrom maybe would be right and we'd find ourselves somewhere like this, where the sentient and intelligent complexity of our machinery would be able to at last match us. Machines would in fact write poems. Maybe they would manage businesses or manage states. Interesting to posit. <laughs> However, if there were AI programmers that never had to sleep, didn't have to go to college, never made any mistakes, we might suppose that maybe one day we get here where there would be something of greater sentient and moral worth than ourselves. Similarly, as your Labrador Retriever cannot possibly contemplate irony or Marxism, it's reasonable to suppose, maybe yours does, right, mine doesn't, um, it, 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 it's, it's reasonable to suppose that there are in fact not only sensory experiences, but concepts and ideas that we can't possibly compute given our hardware, just can't, as human beings, is what it is. In fact, it's, it's, it's not only reasonable to suppose, but supposed by many that if we were to get to human level intelligence, there would be an explosion of intelligence and sentience itself that would vastly outstrip any words we have to articulate it. And that there would be a flexible, ever evolving kind of an intelligence unlike anything biology has been able to create. But, but, but we should make note that this has not happened yet, okay? Uh, we don't have human level computers. There are computers that write really good poems at this point. There's are bad poems, but not very good poems. Um, and we may be coming up on plateaus. So we saw those exponential curves, but we might be hitting some kind of a plateau before we touch what human is. You know, we gave it jeopardy, we gave it chess, you know, but, but maybe there's only a couple more of those wins before it stops, before computers can really only do so much. Maybe we can replicate some kind of intelligence, but not very much. Maybe we can replicate a little bit of what sentience is, some kind of feeling and, and, and real experiential being in a machine, but not much more than like a fish or a very minor animal of some sort. Um, maybe there's something in the human skull that, that science will never get its hands fully around. Something special about us, something magic. But we might also suppose that we've chuckled a few times the very notion of magic here on this stage tonight. A and that I, I won't speak about any certainties and I don't have a crystal ball. That's not what I'm here for. But I will say there were many people that, that thought that man flight and, and the human genome were literally impossible and had to live through seeing it happen in their own lifetime. And, and I think that it's reasonable to say that it's more dangerous than ever in this time of exponentially improving technologies to hide intellectually under the rock of it hasn't happened yet, so it never will. Right? The, the, the ice caps haven't completely melted yet, maybe that'll never happen either. Or b better, better to look at the facts, I think. And if the facts are in fact the way they are, and if any of these experts are remotely on the, on the right page here, then we have some questions worth pondering, I think. What kind of an artificial intelligence should corporations be able to build without regulation? If we are going to be able to construct alive machines who could suffer at our hands, should we do that at all? Or should we make them only capable of experiencing pleasure, maybe, no matter how we treat them? But, but if that's the case, would they not have sympathy with our sorrows? And would they not feel as bad about harming us if they were astronomically more intelligent than us? If we could set laws around bounding AI within the United States, what would ever stop another nation from doing the same developments themselves if there would be economic and military advantages? And, and there are. I think these are interesting questions. It's reasonable to say that, that maybe these are questions we've never come close to tackling. Ask yourself this. What makes a dog's life less worthy than a human's life. Not that it doesn't matter, but if you're in a train and you've got to hit one and save the other, why a human? Is it opposable thumbs? Is it the fact that they wear shirts like you do? Or is there something about the consciousness of a human being? Is it the emotional range of happiness and sadness? Is it the self that we can build in our own mind? Is it, is it our ability to relate and to love? Whatever those qualities are, think of what it is for you. What makes human life more worthwhile than that of other creatures? And if AI can crack open that door, what does that imply? When machines not only trounce us in chess and silly games, but in fact supersede us in the very moral traits and qualities that we suppose make us unique and make our lives worthwhile, what do we mean and how do we matter then? And I don't think these questions get answered on a TED stage, folks. But I do think that hopefully 
um, some of these seeds are placed in events like this, and maybe some of these ideas gain momentum here. I think that in order for any kind of idea to trickle to policy and to regulation, it first has to become worthy of contemplation and worthy of dialogue. And I think that's what I'm aiming to spark, um, because I don't really know the answers to these problems. But I will say that, luckily, this isn't the first grand moral concern that will involve global unity in some way, shape, or form to hedge our, our bets. Here, to, to keep ourselves safe. We already have the UN, we have uh, the World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, organizations working at uniting humans around making a better world for us all, hopefully, and so this could be another one of those efforts. And, and I think that the, the cosmopolitan ideal is more alive now than ever. I think this notion, despite our conflicts, generation after generation, I think education and exposure are making us more and more likely to embrace other humans of any skin color, of any gender or type and maybe even all sentient beings. We have laws against the abuse of animals. And I don't see that trend of expanding circles of sentiment slowing down. I don't. And that heartens me, because I think we'll need a lot of that well-intended collaboration if we are to survive the technologies that we'll make. But where my pessimism lies is the fact that many of those global collaborations have first involved tragedy. In order for the League of Nations to come together, we first needed World War I. And it was decades after the tragedies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki before the Non-Proliferation Treaty for Nuclear Weapons came into play, seriously. And many people think that we are decades behind when it comes to putting in place serious global regulation around protecting the environment that sustains all of our lives. And so the, the way that I see it now is that these, these, the way that the trajectory of these technologies is headed, the genuine perspective of the people in this field, and given the moral consequence of not only destroying ourselves, but maybe creating what's beyond us, I think that it behooves us to wake up before the machines do. Thank you. Wow.